So I think Hello, there are a few people Joanna. here Joanna. we could do we could do Joanna. quick introductions and um, I can give a, a quick background on COPE and then um, we have a, a presentation just to like walk through the meeting and Wayne yeah. and Clayton will be leading that. Um, I'll okay. share my screen though just to click us through but I'll quickly say hello. My name is Hannah. Um, I work for Northeast Maritime Institute, which is a private maritime college based in Massachusetts. Um, we offer a two-year associate degree in nautical science, um, and all of our students graduate with the requirements to apply for a U.S. Coast Guard license. Um, and a couple of years ago, we decided to stand up the Center for Ocean Policy and Economics, COPE, um, which is really a digital think tank is what we call it. And it's an online platform for people to come together, have discussions on important ocean and maritime related topics, um, and to try to figure out how we can provide solutions um, at like a regional and global scale. Um, so really, it's a platform for people to come together. And we're here to help facilitate conversations that people are passionate about. Um, and this is one of them. So welcome to everyone else. Hi, and Thank you, uh, Clayton, Burke. Hi, guys. How are you? It's been a long time, Amy. <laughs> uh, not not as long as you've been at it, but it's been several years. But yeah, Wayne and I are, we're, I guess we were honored enough to be given chair positions for the, for the Marine Entanglement Debris Program through COPE. Yes. So I'll let you guys introduce yourselves too, and we'll, we'll, yeah. Um, I'll go next. Uh, Amy Knowlton, New England Aquarium. Um, uh, I, I work on monitoring the uh, entanglement rates of North Atlantic right whales and human impacts and their effects on health and survival and various uh, aspects of that. So I've been very, uh, very involved in the Ropeless Consortium. I'm a part of the board now and um, you know, so a lot going on at the aquarium on many fronts, but that's been my main role. So. Yes. Nice. Great. Um, I guess I'll go. Um, Anne DeMonte, I am with Sustainable Fisheries Partnership, or SFP. I am their new Protecting Ocean Wildlife Program Manager. It's a new position for SFP. Um, I just began with them in August. Uh, previously, I worked for the Audubon Society of Rhode Island. Um, as the director of their nature center and aquarium and their lead on their marine um, um, issues and conservation efforts. Um, I've been working with right in the right whale world for about 20 years now for conservation for right whales. Previously, I did a lot with ship strike issues, recreational ship strike issues. Uh, so sort of switching gears to entanglement um, matters, um, but no, I'm excited to be part of the group. So thank you for inviting me. Great. Hi, um, I'm Joanna. I am very brand new to this group, but I'm excited to be here. I recently finished up a master's at Stony Brook University for marine conservation and policy, and I have a special interest in the North Atlantic right whale because I'm here in Boston and they are right in our backyard. So I am looking um, forward to hearing more about mitigation strategies for those um, the right whales, but also just to hear in general what you guys are doing as I am new to the field, but really, really excited to get going. Excellent. Great. I should have noticed, sorry, I'm in, I'm in Rhode Island, um, just about an hour south of Boston. So just for, and I'm right down the street from New Bedford, uh, where Hannah's is. So. Oh, right on. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. You're, you're okay. just somewhere on the other side of the bay, Amy, aren't you? No, I'm in, I'm in uh, Cambridge, in Boston oh. area. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Right on. Great. Right on. <laughs> Great. So, yeah, our Ropeless Consortium. Here, I'll start sharing my screen. Great. There we are. Yeah. And then we can. <clears throat> can everyone see it? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Okay. So this is just kind of like a, a brief agenda, um, some talking points, and it's meant to help us today because I think a, a goal of today should be to figure out what we all are passionate about and would like to work on and what the 
the most important things to tackle are. Um, so these are some talking points to guide us through and we can move from topic to topic as quickly or slowly as we like, depending on how conversation goes. But again, just to help us guide through the meeting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and these are just a few notes from previous meetings on some topics we've talked about. Um, so technology and innovation all around, uh, around ropeless fishing, um, ropeless consortium, how to work with fishermen, um, the need for mandates around proper gear tagging and the need for um, data sharing platforms. And so Wayne and Clayton, I'll pass it to you. Okay, I'm doing this box here. Sorry, I just have a little box open that stops blocking some. Oh, yeah. So yes, um, participation of fishermen throughout the consortium. Yes, this I, I noticed there, there's there's way more fishermen involved this season. It seems like they're they're slowly coming around to. You know what I mean? They're going to have to adapt or be left behind. So. But it seems there's more enthusiastic response from fishermen this year, which is excellent. And uh, the frequencies that are being proposed from the 17 to 32 hertz kilograms, that's excellent for development work. It's great for research and actual deployments and testing. But until there's an actual certified set of channels or range of channels for the ropeless gear it, it's going to prevent widespread development because what's going to work here on the east coast is not necessarily going to work in the gulf of mexico or over around hawaii yeah so there's there's definitely a little more to do there and the the chart plotter systems seem to be i wouldn't say there are ready for online use but they seem to be much more reliable and much more user friendly in the in the newest generations that we've been looking at uh, the I think edge, edge tech okay. the edge tech area yeah, that's um that's still sort of a hybrid type gear where the rope does go down so it still leaves rope in the water column and the bigger problem with we've had discussions with fishermen is having to haul all the extra rope and then reset it it's, a, it's adding time and it's adding on deck time and fatigue to the deck hands and, and fuel costs and obviously a larger carbon footprint when there when there's more time on the water than necessary yes so it's as these systems combine and come together i'm, uh, I'm sure we're going to have a successful set of gear for each region but just hopefully it's not going to take from three to five years because at that point we could be well under we could be into 290 280 right whales left which would be absolutely devastating yeah did anyone here get the opportunity to join the ropeless consortium this year Excellent. yes i was, I was there in person oh. so did you have any like standout points from from I was attending. also there for the meeting. Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the standout points that was mentioned a couple of different times is that the government agencies, DFO and NOAA, need to make decisions because until they make some major decisions about, you know, the interoperability and uh, that sort of thing. It, it, like you said, Wayne, it is hard to sort of focus on the development. And I think the other thing that maybe is coming through is like I, every fishery that's testing is probably going to have different needs for what what they like or don't like. And I think yeah. for fishermen to have the flexibility to choose a gear type that is approved and that they they prefer over another is going to be important to you know, yeah, we, that we still have traditional fishermen um, here around Nova and not, Scotia. You know, so I, and I think that's being Sorry. built into the system. Yeah, the, the yeah, choice well, is important, uh, Amy, for sure, because yeah. we have guys here in different regions that would prefer a wooden lobster trap over a wire lobster trap, over a wire trap. 
and different designs of, of traps if they're built in Nova Scotia versus built in, built in PEI. They, 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 there's ongoing generational arguments of, of what gear works better and who, <laughs> how easy it is to interact with. So, yeah. yes, definitely, I can, I can agree with you 100% on choice has to be an option. Yeah. Now, do no, you I feel like? Agree. Sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was just going to say I would agree with Amy that I think the next step is to move this government for government to move some of this from experimental fishing to allowing for permits for active fishing. Um, yeah. You know, based on some of the successes in certain areas. But I think gear, like Amy noted, some things with gear conflict and and whatnot are going to and regulations are going to need to be combated before we can move on some of this stuff can can move along and move on and i think it's important to remember and remind fishers that this it's not a complete switch off and leaving of their historical traditional fishery it's a it's a tool um that's going to be used in these areas where ept species are 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 in that area or closures due to those ept species such as north atlantic right whales yeah do you feel like there's anything missing right now that's holding them back from implementing that change from experimental to active? Well, I do think this interoperability is a big hurdle. And that's, I think, why everybody's like, okay, governments, you got to make some, mm. make some tough decisions. And um, I think that's the biggest thing holding Pull back and the regulations, as Ann mentioned, that I think from what I my discussions with Noah is like the regulations are like they have the gear pretty far along, as we all know. Yeah. But but the regulations have to be implemented and you know uh there's some also an issue up in Maine, which I don't know the details about, but I wanna I'm gonna try and find out more, but they have a closure right now in offshore main waters, but they, from what I understand, and I don't know if this is totally accurate, Maine has a gear library, gear lending library, but because of an equity issue, uh, they're not able to loan the gear out because if not all fishermen can have access, then yep. they're saying none can have access. And which I, I think that's, that was surprising to me. And I don't know if, I, anybody else knows anything further, but that's uh, we I have think some getting contacts. to the bottom of that will be important. We have some contacts down in Maine. We'll, we'll definitely reach out to them. Yeah. Yeah. And For I have sure. a meeting set up with Maine DMR to ask them this too. So, um, yeah, I was going to uh, ask if you've got, if you're good at meeting with Brian E. Di Donahue because she's overseeing those gear libraries. Um, yes. We're going to meet with her. Um, sometime in the coming week so mm -hmm. i'm happy to let you know what i hear um that'd be great yeah but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I had anyway it's with... it's a yeah. go ahead oh, i'm sorry amy I, I had met with briny uh she gave a presentation for the food industry conference um about beginning of october and she did not make any mention of that so that's new that's new new news yeah, and again, I think before you reach out, I want to make sure that this is accurate news yeah. because I, I sort of heard this, and I just don't know if it's a if it's really a reality or just a rumor. So, um, I can happily let you know what I hear when we have a conversation with Maine DMR and uh, next yeah, week. Yeah, well, we yeah. Wayne and I will reach out this week also to Ed Triple from Department of Fisheries and Oceans, the, the lead biologist for Canada. We were hoping he would have joined today, but he, something, he, came up, yeah. something came up. He had a conflict, so mm -hmm. our, our hands are kind of tied here research-wise because Canada, right now, the only paperwork they possess for testing is for weak link inserts. Yeah. They do have a few programs testing a dart with, with the ropeless gear, but they're very limited trials, very small amounts of gear. And it, it seems to be heavily overburdened on um, the reporting requirements. There's so many agencies involved in every move that it takes it takes sometimes days, if not a week or two, to get some of the some of the movement that they need to be able to go out at certain times of the year and when there's other stuff like Halifax is a big it's part of the Atlantic part of NATO 
so it's it, it's a very busy military port. There's a lot, so there's a, there are a lot of restrictions here too, right? So some of it's understandable, but it, it doesn't help our timeline, no. Mm -hmm. Right, and I do know there was a story presented at the Ropeless Consortium about a testing of the Canadian Wildlife Federation trying to get gear to the Misku Island fishermen, and then it backfired because DFO, there was some miscommunication with the uh, DFO um, that, so that ropeless gear that the goal was to allow fishermen into that area that had been closed because of a right whale sighting was yeah. not able to be deployed, um, which is unfortunate. So it's like those sorts of hurdles, I think, are important to yeah, I think, think about Amy, how DFO can improve that. So. Amy and I have discussed earlier, but I don't know if you guys were aware, um, they came out with the, the weak link inserts and approved them here in Canada. So Prince Edward Island, the entire commercial fishing fleet in Prince Edward Island adopted the, the weak link inserts, bought them, took the time to put them in their ropes. And the minute a right whale came around the top of Cape Breton heading up to Gulf of St. Lawrence, they put everyone back on the dock and wouldn't let them use the gear. So there was a, a lot of time spent in gear preparation, a lot of money and effort spent in wages and product. And they were just basically tied to the dock. They, they literally couldn't go out and fish. Hmm. So yeah, that seems like counterintuitive. Like if, you know, similar to Massachusetts, Massachusetts has the closed area during the time when right whales are known to be aggregated. And then the rest of the year, they require weak links throughout the end line every 60 feet, not just the top half or top third, which is what's required in other areas. Yeah. And to me, that's the most, it's the most, you know, weak ropes. I did a, a five minute speed talk for the consortium about our work looking at weak links and time, how it can reduce the time of an entanglement because, um, you know, down to less than 23 seconds if it hits the end line and the weak link is below where the whale hits. So it's, you know, if the if the fishermen, especially in areas where right whales are not common, are able to integrate the weak links throughout the end line, and I don't know what PEI has required on that front. Um, I think it was in the top third. Okay, see, I feel like that's that's okay, but it's not great. So... And I think, it, it, you know, we've shown that in waters less than 300 feet that weak links could be integrated throughout the entire end line. And I imagine around PEI, it's not that high a water depth, right? Not so much PEI. Cape Breton, Newfoundland, Labrador, yeah, we have some extremely deep water. There's, there's some yeah, trials out of Newfoundland that are 15, 1600 feet. So it's, Yeah, that's a whole different ball game, I know, for the offshore fisheries, but... Mm -hmm. And it'd be great if the weak links, as they functioned, and say a large a large whale, a North Atlantic right whale, for for example, would get entangled in the gear when the when the separation occurs. There should be a GPS marker attached to the the end that stays with the mammal, so that the next time it surfaces, it would send a ping, and then every time it surfaces for a certain period of time, it would ping. It It'll give the last close known location of the gear at the break for recovery to prevent ghost fishing and obviously debris, but it'll also give a live tracking for any entangled mammals and maybe a more successful chance at, at, at recovery before any more damage occurs or at any infections or rope rope cutting into the flesh. It's a, it, it, it's a terrible, it's definitely terrible with what's going on with, with the mammals for sure. But the weaklings again don't protect the younger juveniles or or the or the year the yearling calves. If they get entangled, they, they don't have enough strength. To well, that's not weeks. that's not quite accurate. We've looked at that in relation to some other research. Um and I'm happy to send you guys the link to my speed talk because I do I do cover that question because that comes up a lot. Excellent. That Great. Suggests that you know juveniles aren't going to be helped, but um, it they I think they would benefit from the weak 
weak links if if integrated throughout the end line. So I think you know that's my question of like down the road. I I don't nobody's talking about a time when ropeless will be required year round everywhere. <laughs> Right in the right wealth range, and until that time, I think weak links are an important assistant, a complementary um, For sure. tool. For sure. Mm -hmm. So that's why I sort of, uh, I, and I know they can't be used everywhere, but I do feel like it's got to keep keep that as a tool in the toolbox because keep that in the toolbox so yeah that's, we, we had that conversation with that triple that the, the weak links could be incorporated into the top line buoy which would take the slack at the line and adding the weak link and proper identification the, 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 the mammals wouldn't be going with much more buoyancy with a top line in, involved in an entanglement than they would be with a traditional buoy for like a crab pot or something to, depending on the depth of the water of course the, the smaller lobster traps they may, they may have additional buoy because of the weight of the assembly but they would still have the gps tagging so it'd be, it'd be much more a much better chance of assisting them yep. in the event of an entanglement and so those that does the GPS tag just get activated when it how does that get activated? On the tot line system, they they would be updated in the event of any tampering, say once they were set and their location was marked, the GPS system would basically be on standby and allow for tides and winds and waves, but I'd say in the event of tampering if somebody come up and tried to remove that to tamper with the gear once it was activated it would send a gps marker and if the if the tampering continued it would update the marking so as say if somebody was fishing somebody else's gear or somebody went out to cut the rope on somebody's gear and that started to float away the gps marking would be there of that event of the disconnection or the entanglement and it will update regularly while it's moving. If it came stationary again with just wind and tide, it would reset and go back into basically sleep mode. But on the weak links, it, it could be as simple as some of the styles like the, I see they, they'll sometimes attach with uh, time release glue or stuff to turtles and whales, and they can mount them for three or four days, right? Before the, before the unit falls off. So if something like that was incorporated in the weak link, you would actually get a real time entanglement event notification. And the fact that the that end of the weak link was moving, you you, you definitely have concrete evidence that a more a more refined search area. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's attached to the buoy. To well, the buoy one would system. be attached to the buoy system itself. And then if the weak link was incorporated somehow as the weak link activated and separated, there'd be one on the end of the weak link, even say using the traditional buoy setup. If the weak link had the, the GPS tracker as it separated from the bottom half, every time it surfaced, it would update its location and the, there'd be a record of an active entanglement. Yeah, sounds high tech, but I don't know the where that I know the smart buoys are out there, but I don't know. Smart buoys, the, the GPS units themselves. If you if you check, and I hate to say like Chinese suppliers, but Asian suppliers. If you're buying in the units of ten thousand or fifty thousand units, they become right. down to into the dollars and cents in the price range. So if they if they if they worked, stayed on standby during the season that the battery lasted if the entanglement or if the link didn't break that it'd do for the whole season they'd be it'd be easy enough to change or change halfway through the season depending on cost and battery life and has anybody up there trialed this technology um uh, not as far as attaching it to the link and following it but it, it'd be the same as attaching it to to a mammal that's no, yeah, what I mean, if you kind of, every time it surfaces yeah. for air, you, you you get the location and the ping, kind of like the they're doing 
something similar with the shark tracking here in Atlanta, Canada. They tag several of them every summer and they, they'll monitor their movements up and through around the Gulf of St. Lawrence and St. Pierre Miquelon over in the French territory. And so it, it, it's a very successful technology. It would just have, it'd be like the weak links or the ropeless. Long-term adoption would take time, yes. Mm -hmm. But that can be tested pretty easily. I mean, even not necessarily during fishing, but just out on the open water between two vessels, you could have several weak links set up set between ropes and allow them to separate and guys go in different directions and you should be able to follow the boat with the with the end attached pretty pretty closely with the, the GPS unit. So proof of concept wouldn't be very difficult to Yeah. You know I mean? And it is reliable technology, the the marking. The mm -hmm. On um, any of the seen something recently, correct me if I'm wrong, that there was a form of magnetite found in the North Atlantic right whale brain. So like some magnetite cell or something that could suggest that besides following the scent trail of their food, that they could be influenced by the magnetic fields. I haven't heard about that. No, I haven't. No. I have not heard anything about that either. Okay, we're no. going to have to go back and look for that. But yeah. I definitely yeah. watched it, but that could be one of those, you know what I mean? Like, kind of like a fake news story, somebody's opinion, right? The, but we definitely watched yeah, we definitely it. Had a link for it. And, and had a link for it. So we'll have to go back through our records and find that. Mm -hmm. Because it's, and, and has there anything conclusive come out of the group that broke off and stayed in the New York, New York area of right whales this summer? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, anything? Can, no. Yeah, can you repeat as, as that? Again? Any conclusive like, information coming out that of there, could there be a reason? Was there a rise in maybe the photoplankton that stayed in the New York area due to temperatures or sea anomalies? I, I know or, there was a lot of uh, calanus plankton there. Oops. Okay. Oops, sorry. Sorry, I got, I got cut off. What? what yeah. No, I think you answered it, Amy. I think, uh, yeah, I think we saw an increase in food source in that area. Um, and so, and it, as if you didn't hear Amy, she just said about the calanus increase in there. It's probably calanus planted increase, yes. Yeah, increase, yeah. Um, and yep. I don't know, unless you do, Amy, if that was a occurrence thing, I think you'd have to look at oceanographic modeling to see if that was uh, what caused that. Uh, I, don't, I don't know, Amy, unless you know. Now, there are some oceanographers who are looking at plankton levels and layers. And I think there's a one of the things that came out of the consortium meeting was a need to do some more coordination with oceanographers and look at uh, predictions. And um, there's been a lot of work on that front. So, uh, but it's, I think the information has not been collated well to help help us all understand where where we might want to look for right whales, where when they might show up in these weird uh, areas that aren't typically seen like that. So I think there's yes. more going on on that front. Mm -hmm. OK, there are some good. Um, magnetic field mapping from NASA. NOAA and NASA, but one is the svs.gsfc.nasa.gov. And they've tracked the magnetic field patterns of the seabed and tides and current changes somewhat through it, but we we haven't gotten through that whole report yet. But there's definitely some good information in there as far as the the effect of tide and currents due to Earth's magnetic field in certain areas and the anomalies happen. There's a there's a dead spot in the South Atlantic, I believe, that's kind of very low magnetic fields i don't know how they they would measure it but there, there's an area of very low magnetism in the south atlantic that seems to be an anomaly so if that weak region i don't know it could cause some changes in current maybe that's how those the, the plankton migrated in the wrong direction or something following and another one is the ncei dot noah.gov is the 
Center for Environmental Information. They have very good magnetic field mapping. So it's, whether or not that turns out to be that that was a an anomaly, that story about the magnetite, or it, it turns into something constructive, there's at least maybe a, a chance to correlate the migration patterns with any changes or fluctuations in the magnetic field. And it may understand some strandings and, and you know, some mass strandings of different species, not only in the North Atlantic right whale, but other, other whales that have been in the 50s and 100s just showing up on beaches. Are they getting turned around maybe because of undersea cables or offshore wind cables coming back with the, the electromotive, elect, electromagnetic output that's changing or altering their sense of direction? Yeah, I think that's a whole another can of worms that oh, it definitely uh, is. <laughs> could, uh, yeah, black hole to sort of uh, go down. I don't know if that's the issues um, you for know, the right whale for you know say, yeah. yeah, it right whale issues as far as entanglement. I'm I mean I think that's all interesting research to look into, but um, I think solving some of these immediate more immediate issues may be a maybe the easy low rung the ladder to grab so to speak um i think yeah. if you want to talk about uh stranding issues and mass stranding issues those types of things you might want to reach out to the ifa people on uh, on the cape who handle uh, those mass stranding issues along cape cod um they might have some insight for you as far as that's concerned but um unfortunately we don't see fortunately or unfortunately see you know if a right well ends up on the beach, it's usually entanglement or ship strike. It's not due yes. to yeah for yeah. for right whales. Right, yeah, yeah, and I think other species, you know, I think looking at the food resources is, I think what the whales are primarily driven by food, and mm -hmm. that's true for right whales and probably other species that are showing up in pretty high high mortality levels. I know the food resources increased dramatically in the near shore waters. So yeah, I, I agree with Anne that the magnetic field stuff is not not something I think is going to be very relevant to the questions. Very, very far out on hand. the fringe. Yeah. Yeah. Well yeah. that's hey, that's great advice. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we just, I mean, right before the the day before the consortium, um, the World Plus Consortium, we had a humpback that moved into Narragansett Bay, uh, which is a very small area for and very unusual for these animals to come up and we we figured it was just chasing food right some its food source came in and it chased after it so i think that's pretty common for these animals um you know they're going to go where the food is um, just like a coyote chasing a deer is going to follow a pack of deer wherever those deer go so there's you know it's yeah just there was i think a one lone gray whale showed up in the northern atlantic this spring Right. And would have, would have had to come through the Northwest Passage, basically. So it was definitely, it was definitely food driven. No, there'd be no other reason for the animal to stray that far off course, right? Right. Right. So that's, that's good. That's excellent. Um, yeah, three to five year timeline. That's, that's, that's a heavy one. Like, what what would be the projections in possible entanglements and serious entanglements or deaths five years out for right well? Well, well I, would, just, uh, I, I know there's a take for the, or an allowable take for the offshore wind development too. So it's like if, if you add those factors in, what kind of numbers are we looking at? Well, I don't know about any takes from wind energy, but I think from the entanglement side, we in 2024 alone, we've had seven entanglements. Um, we don't know where most of them happened. I think at least one happened in U.S. waters, but that whale was able to shed the gear. The others happened somewhere between the U.S. and Canada. Well, one happened, one or two definitely happened in Canada. Um, one, so one from Yarmouth, yes. For sure. What's that? One, one, one set of gear was from Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, for sure, for last year's winter fishery. Yeah. Yeah, that was a couple of years ago that um, that was picked up. Uh, 
the whale named Argo. So anyway, I think I think we are continuing to see way too high levels of entanglement. And my one concern I have with the Canadian situation is that the gear trials are very limited, even for the weak link stuff. Um, yeah. Agreed. And the ropeless, ropeless work. So I think Canada has a lot more to to work on and the US but, too, but and, and the Canada US has, has regulations yeah. coming in. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I say Canada does have a, a lot of catching up to do uh, and a lot more money to spend on, on, on than what, what they've been providing. For sure. They they even cut down the funding on the ghost gear, the ghost gear recovery. They stopped it along right from the St. Lawrence River right down through Nova Scotia, right to the coast, right to the edge of Maine. To, 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 and do you know not... why? Do you know why they did that? Um, they're saying that the the fund ran out, but I mean the the, the fund should <laughs> the fund shouldn't have ran out. I don't know where you know. I, maybe half the fund went to Ukraine. I don't know, but it, it definitely, if if the money was put there for it, the money should have been kept for that and and not for office or clerical use it should have been that should that should have been money spent at the water's edge pretty much but yeah. apparently it apparently it depleted extremely fast and I've, in canada here there's like you guys got an access to information act that in canada that process would take us eight or ten years that by the time we got all the paperwork and it'd be mostly redacted so yeah it, it, it's near impossible to find out you mean to find out about funding situation or? Yeah, or well, the, unless they get a new grant next year, maybe it'll start back up again in the spring. But yeah, you know, that's we were we were kind of hoping to be able to pin Ed to the wall today to ask him a few questions. So I'm going to have to get him personally and we'll definitely get back to you guys with all the answers that, that we can find from the Canadian side. Mm -hmm. Because it, it seems in all the literature, they're paying word service to the fact that they're working together and they're collaborating. But at the same time, nothing similar has happened. What's happened in Canada doesn't seem to be happening in the U.S. What's happening on your guys' end on the East Coast is different than the West Coast, and it's different in Canada, and it's different than our West Coast. It, it, it's, it seems to be coming together that definitely I see changes and improvements in the communication through all the agencies, but it's... There's, there seems like there maybe needs to be a legislative body or something assembled just to cover those topics. Maybe, maybe well, that's where an effort needs to be put in. Well, I know, yeah, I know they have the bilateral meetings, but I don't know how they, between the government agencies, but I don't know much about how they operate and what they what they come up with. But. Results wise, it doesn't seem to be, you know what I mean, that there has been much published so hopefully something will, will come of it. Know what I mean? You get the right people in there that everybody's like, if if we had a, a group like you guys and, and past attendees on those panels in those places, I'm sure we wouldn't be having these problems right now. There'd be something done about it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering if there's a way to identify who participates in those meetings. And so we can figure out how to have conversations with them and figure out what needs to be done and how to persuade. Well, you mean the bilateral any... meetings? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or are they closed? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. They're they're mm -hmm. closed. I mean, they're yeah. they're government to government. So okay. I don't know how we insert ourselves into that. It's yeah. Um, yeah. Well, Wayne, isn't there going to be um, in February? There's going to be the international gear. Uh, gear meeting up in Canada coming up in, in February. Yes, there is mention of that. I haven't, I don't know any details. Yeah, I don't. I talked to Elizabeth over at Canfish. Um, she doesn't have any additional details. Only the dates have been set. I think like February 20, like around the 25th of February. Um, and so I know she's, as soon as she hears anything, she's going to probably forward it over to me and I can forward it to others. But I know that's a meeting coming up that might be a, a place to chat as well. well. We'll check here through the Cove too and yeah. Northwest University and, and our Memorial University in Newfoundland through their marine program. That's hopefully it's, it's close by. We'll be able to attend that. 
see what's up, see if we can insert ourselves in for sure. <laughs> I think part of the key is just to continue to have these types of conversations. You know, the rope list meeting is a great platform uh, to have these continued conversations. Um, and I think I think it's it's getting there. You know, I think um, the more you hear from fishers, such as when Mike Lane got up and said, you know, this is paying my mortgage. I think those kinds of listenings and hearings and efforts, at least I think, are going to move things forward a little bit. I know for SFP side, our mission now after the consortium, after the both the annual meeting and the ropeless meeting is to try to get seafood buyers more involved in this process and have them to come to some of these meetings, um, educate them a little bit on what's happening. Um, so to go from the, you know, what top down to sort of thing. Um, yeah. So that will be, that'll be something we'll be, we'll be concentrating on for the next year um, and uh, in the, for the seafood show, we hope to have a panel to educate um, seafood buyers, um, those types of things, so. Yeah, and I think COPE can act as a great platform to continue those conversations throughout the years or throughout mm -hmm. the year and um, figuring out who to invite in because I know like those big things happen, but they only happen so often and I think something needs to be done in between those meetings to like get the work done that's discussed at those meetings. And that's really the goal of this platform is to figure out how we can achieve those goals in between the meetings um, and allowing people to get to know one another as well on, on like a more personal level, I guess. Um, so I think if there are people who have attended the Ropeless Consortium or who will be at the seafood show or different meetings that you feel like would be great to connect with, feel free to send their information over to me and I can reach out and see if we're able to, to bring them into this group, um, to have some conversations with them um, from things that you, you've you been saying. And with the seafood buyers, I have some friends who work um, in kind of the policy side of that, that <laughs> I'm confused why I haven't brought them into this conversation as well. Um, <laughs> So I think it's just figuring out who the important players are. And I think it's having as di diverse as a group of people as we can. Um, so, yeah. Well, Amy, correct me if I'm wrong. There was some discussion about having additional, the Ropeless Consortium having uh, some additional meetings this year or uh, beyond just the annual meeting. Is that correct? Yeah, we're going to be having a conversation tomorrow, the ropeless board to debrief about the meeting and think okay. about next steps. And I can mention that you've you've suggested this. Um, you know, we want to make sure we're not duplicating efforts, because, right. you know, because there's just so many conversations happening and want to make sure whatever we put forward makes. You know, is is going to be helpful to the situation at hand, and that's yes. where. There's so many, so many entities sort of involved in all these different situations that, um, uh, yeah. So I think I I'll, I'll mention it to the ropeless board, and, um, you know, I'll think about like, are there, you know, maybe there are ways to get the seafood buyers uh, to the table in a way. We we have a project going on on that front, but we it's still not fleshed out, so I can't really I can't really tell you much about it because we haven't figured it out yet. But um, yeah. you know, trying to help buyers understand where where it's safe to get their product from that's not going to be harmful to whales is is one thing that we're trying to uh, yeah. think about how to. Put Our forward. Atlanta Canada lobster had a red flag on it for a year for the for the seafood buyers. It, it was removed this year, thankfully, but it, it definitely hurts the bottom line of all the all the sellers, and it probably hurt cost wise for the buyers because they they the ones that didn't want to buy a product with the red flag would obviously have to shop elsewhere at a higher premium and, and different shipping and different connections. So it's it's unfortunate when that happens, but it's. It's probably a good thing that it exists because it does shine more light 
on the issue for each region that gets hit. Like there's been a lot more activity in Nova Scotia since the lobster and the seafood would hit the red tag here than there had been for the two or three years prior. So it's 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 almost like a trade embargo type of thing, I guess. That, but it, it it seemed to actually make a difference here in the province of Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. That's good to hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be really interested to hear how your meeting tomorrow goes. Um, if you'd be willing to share that and let us know what the kind of proposed path forward is. Um, because, yeah, I agree. We don't want to duplicate efforts. We want to make sure we're actually helping this entire process move forward. So I think figuring out how we can best do that and where we fit into all of that, um, we kind of need to hear what's going on elsewhere. So if you would be willing to share that, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, you know, once we have the conversation, I'll see what, um, see where things are going and let you know. So. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, that's awesome, guys. Thanks, man. Nice. Um, on the, the grant opportunities, um, and if you don't mind, maybe you take over that part. We, we, Wayne and I have stayed away so far from the, the funding and the grant opportunities because we have products that the optics we feel the optics would look good that we were you know what i mean sharing sharing grant information so if, if, maybe if that's possible Hannah, if you don't mind to take over that part and yeah i think we, we don't even need to dive too much into this right now because it feels like this conversation was really good in talking about the need for i guess government to take the next step and i think there are a lot of people in the u.s who are testing out different systems um, again, I'd be interested to hear about Maine and their gear library and what's going on there. And seems like in Canada, they need to allow for a lot more experimentation and implementation. Um, I think we can talk about grant opportunities, but I think we it would be more useful to figure out where we fit into things before diving into that and figure out kind of enough. what our goal is. Um, so there are grants that are out there, but I think figuring out what we would like to achieve would be great first. Um, and I think reaching out to more potential participants is something that I'm definitely gonna do. And if anyone else would like to reach out to people about potential participation, I think that would be great. Um, COPE was created by a Maritime College and the basis of that is education, and it sounds like a big piece that's missing is educating people on where to get safe products from. Um, so I think that's one area that I know we can fill and we can fill well. Um, Northeast Maritime has an online learning platform called Northeast Maritime Online, which is NEMO for short, and we can build whatever courses we want. And I think this is a great thing to consider. Um, creating educational materials on um, finding safe products. And also we could create some around gear marking and, and different types of gear down the line. So yeah. I think it's just something to keep in mind. It's keep in mind is the educational component um, and the resources that we already have available. So yeah, I think yeah. we just need to, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm sorry, Hannah, go ahead. I cut you off. No, no. Okay. okay. Um, well, and I think I want to go back to a little bit of what Amy said about duplicating efforts. Um, yeah. So, I mean, because, um, you know, sustainable fisheries has already been working for quite a while now with a lot of uh, the seafood buyers and suppliers who have already started to fund uh, these projects, such as Publix has given money to the Gear Lending Library. Um, both can fish and in Massachusetts and they're um, funding those projects. So um, there's already some outreach being done. So I think we need to just be careful of, um, you know, duplicating effort and, you know, potentially knocking on doors because my fear is that, you know, <coughs> you're going to hear, well, I already heard from this person and now you're giving me a different message or I'm already involved in <laughs> you know, those, those types of things. So I think, um, as those efforts come on, I think we'll, like you said, to find space for everyone without um, redesigning the wheel. Yeah, definitely. Great point. Yeah. 
And we have a little bit of an a little bit of movement on the Canadian side of the border, Al, as the the oil producing region of Canada would be the province of Alberta, which is pretty much landlocked, uh, otherwise close to the Great Lakes and like the Mississippi River coming north and, and the Red River maybe coming into coming into the prairies. But as part of their new energy program, the energy minister, because they have pipelines coming from Alberta with the with the with the oil, they're connected to the ports that they have some skin in the game now and they're looking to help further along marine development and and debris the whole program so we're, we're we're excited that we we have our our lawyer our law firm from british columbia is setting up a meeting with the energy minister from alberta so hopefully we can get some movement on on the west coast as well because there's there's a lot on the east coast but every little bit helps and different perspectives would definitely be certainly welcome i'm sure hannah and wayne and i we definitely value everybody's opinion, and yes, we, we we go through the meetings one after the other, and, and, and regurgitate the information and and look look do a few more research on the topics. So hopefully, we'll be better prepared for the next one. Yeah, yeah, and Wayne, you might want to talk to the um, Canadian Wildlife Federation, the Can Fish folks, because. I just had a conversation with them. They're doing cinnamon initiatives on the west, on your west coast um, in the British Columbia area and starting to try some initiatives there based on their success on the east coast. So you may want to reach out to them. Yes, well, we'll have okay. our, actually our guy is in back Vancouver Island, so we'll definitely reach out to them and hopefully we, right. can, we can set up connection there. Yeah, they're, they're, and the person who's in that role, she is brandy new in the role. Like, I think she's been in that role for like, you know, uh, maybe like four or five months. So she's just, just getting started. So that might be a nice place to join forces. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, any last minute points? I, um, I just wanted to mention, so the Atlantic large oil take reduction team is going to be starting up meetings this in 2025. I don't know if those are public or not um, open to the public, but I would encourage you, you know, if you want to really get into the space, I, th I would encourage you to um, attend any of those meetings that you're able because uh, there's a lot, you know, it's a lot going on. So it might be good, good to sort of. Yes. And <laughs> with that in mind, we will find the, the paper that explains the the allowable take for the wind chart, the offshore wind development between the between the seismic and the foundations and the actual assemblies. There's 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 definitely been a take approved by Congress, and in that right. take, the North Atlantic right whale is included. So Correct. It's, yes, it's a, it's a scary. They're different, they're, you know I mean? they're different yeah. levels of takes. Yes, you know, take doesn't mean. It's going to kill a right whale. I mean, no, it's going to no, no, cause no. an impact, sure. potentially cause an impact, and so it's important to. Yeah. But I think some sometimes it's conflated that all these takes mean all these whales are going to be killed by no, wind. No, no, um, just be which, like trying to predict which, an entanglement. Yeah, it'd be next yeah. to impossible. Yeah, so it's it. There's a lot of interesting um, uh, misinformation out there. I feel about the wind energy situation and and the potential impact to whales so um, well, uh, one of our former team members just switched over to a wind energy project and i'm sure she'll be back and forth and she'll have a lot of a lot of insight for us just, yeah uh, that that the more definitely the more information to get to the better we are armed yeah for sure for sure absolutely great it was a great great meeting guys yeah, excellent i thank appreciate you, everybody's input well thank you for pulling everyone together and meeting. Yeah, yeah it's Thank great you. to meet you all. Yes, yeah. definitely. Thank all right, you. Take care.